You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information. friends welcome to episode 13 of storyteller conclaves this is a show all about helping you run the best tabletop role-playing game that you can whether you're a new storyteller or dungeon master learning the craft or an experienced storyteller looking to take your game to the next level i am sarah i'm rob how you doing rob ah uh, you know i'm doing okay good i wouldn't say i'm doing great but i'm doing better now that we're here and actually doing this good 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 it's been a it's been an interesting week it has been so, an interesting week so I've been I think there. it might be weather as well. So yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully the weather's gonna be evening out. But uh, yeah, I've uh, I've been uh, shotgunning a lot of uh, terrain building videos. I'm sure you guys have seen some of the pictures I've been posting on Discord and stuff. You like have, that, so. and they're looking incredible. Uh, one of these days, we're gonna have to have a. Uh, I'm gonna say a dialogue where we talk about terrain building, but I'm gonna have to like monitor your amount of conversation. Right, because you're really <laughs> enthusiastic about it. I mean, I, really enthusiastic. I right. and and I kind of want I kind of want to mention something that happened on Facebook today too, because like I was I was feeling really really good about um like a lot of the terrain that I'm building and right, right. enthusiastic and stuff like that. And like a friend of mine from uh from my LARPing days uh kind of came out of left field and like I did not even know that this person dabbled in like tabletop role playing or or oh. terrain building or anything like that and was like oh yeah I do some of that stuff too and posts this like picture perfect elven garden that they made with like uh, a little like path like multi-tiered pathway and like a fountain with like a little uh waterfall that poured into another one with this big ornate tree in the middle of it and I was like oh okay yeah that was like <laughs> so what, what, I, is that like a zip kind of thing right <laughs> just yeah, happened or, yeah. oh yeah i know i got this little thing <laughs> so I'm, I'm feeling all enthusiastic about like yeah i'm gonna build some scatter terrain with foam and maybe pour some resin so i can, I can make a little cool cool little river for my D game and she's like oh yeah here's a two-tiered waterfall i made by the way yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i'm not saying that they're not allowed to do that but at the same time come on people have it, some like just be like oh that's really really awesome no it was it was you cool know. it was it was cool it was cool it was cool all right uh our updates are lame uh yeah, our Patreon's still going. Thank you everybody who's joining it. We're loving you for every moment of that. Absolutely. I think we just um, got a new one too, right? Yeah, we did. We did get a new one. And next month you guys will see that uh show up because uh just as a reminder, when when you join Patreon through ours, it is a monthly subscription. Mm -hmm. So uh it does the billing a little differently for us because it comes at the first of the next month. Uh so but if we ever do anything that's instantaneously like we're gonna do uh ticketed events or anything like that, we'll definitely be changing that up a little bit. So There'll be a difference there, but right now it's just a lot easier to deal with. Yep, yep. Uh, the Listen Live is still in process. I have no updates. That's about it. Um, so uh, we have a topic. We do have a topic. We have a topic. We were, we kind of dabbled into during our discussion, pre-discussion last week, mm -hmm. not actually on the show, um, where we were talking about storyteller styles. And we got into like – talking about not so much the story itself but the storyteller and how they tell them yeah, yeah. and that kind of led on from there so i think it's a good discussion to kind of have today um and i liked the analogies that we were using to kind of go through the conversation of telling stories so we you and i have i would say a similar overarching style mm -hmm. but we still have differences between us oh absolutely absolutely um, but I think the analogy that I used with parties really was a good way of doing it. And I say parties, not gaming parties, not like your characters in a party going somewhere and doing it. Right, but a legit celebration. Like, yeah, of, or yeah. not even a celebration like, hey, our friends are getting together. So like yeah. when we think about telling a story, mm -hmm. like a lot of people get the um, – I'll use the, the, the tropey term, you know, where it's like – I, you know, I sit down with my friends and we're going to the darkest dungeon and we're going to do this little dungeon crawl and at the end of it, we're going to be done with it. So like it's a one night, one shot kind of thing mm -hmm. or maybe a couple nights that you're going through a module, you know, um, but there's – but that's storytelling. That's the simplicity of it. And 
uh, that's totally not our style. Like we have these epics that we run where mm-hmm. it just it grows and it's built and there's all these other things involved with it. And I thought about it and I was just like, so that's kind of like throwing a party at someone's house or yeah. at your house. Like, yeah. what kind of party person are you? Yeah, are you uh, are you one of those people who says, hey, I'm just gonna have some have some friends over. We're gonna get a case of beer. And a cheap pizza. Yeah. And we're going to sit around the couch and just BS all night and, yep. and, and whatever. And, and that's going to, and we're going to have a great time. Yeah. Or are you one of those people who like, I need to clean the whole house top to bottom because mm-hmm. I'm having guests mm-hmm. and I'm going to pull out the good china. I'm going to vacuum. Mm-hmm. I'm going to, you know, we're, maybe I'll cook. Yeah. I'll have the crock pot on. So we'll have some hors d'oeuvres. Yep. I will suggest bottles of wine they might bring over that will complement the main course. Yeah. Yep. You know, and, and but there's but there's a storytelling style that kind of goes with that. Yeah, and then you you've got those like you know four course formal dinner party pinkies out. There'll mm-hmm. be a champagne brunch after you know kind of right. a thing you know where it's so formalized that when you get to the party you're like wow this is totally not what I expected exactly. And as a player you're not sure about that either. So mm-hmm. I think there's a dialogue that has to come between players and storytellers about the style. Because there's assumptions that get made from previous storytellers you might have hung out with. Like when I went to Gen Con, I did not even think about this. It didn't even cross my mind mm-hmm. what kind of the storytelling was going to be. And it turned out that I we had very different storytellers. Yeah. And it was neat. But at the same time, you know. Uh, it, it can be jarring because you walk yeah. in with a certain expectation as a player yeah. of what sort of game you're going to get into. Mostly because you've, you know, maybe you've played that game before with sure. a different storyteller. So right, you right. think this is the way that Shadowrun is played. Exactly. Because you sat down with Chris and Chris runs his game in a very particular way. Right. But then – so then you're thinking, OK, well, I'm going into a Shadowrun game. I know what to expect. But then the storyteller is completely different. Horrific in, in the case of mm-hmm. Gen Con. Um but uh, you know, or 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 better. I mean, or it, better. It, it, it could have it could have been like you walk into that game going, you know, it could, it could have just just as easily been. Oh wow! I never knew Shadowrun could be this awesome. Exactly, and in our case, it was there was a one shot that was being run, mm-hmm. um, and it was a its own story world that was part of Fifth Edition or Pathfinder that mm-hmm. they, this company had done, and we wanted to sit in on it. And we honestly thought it was just a custom world. We didn't even realize there was a like a group of writers. Out in the media, or not in the, in the merchant area, who was selling it, mm-hmm. and I was. We thought that was super cool, and they thought it was super cool that we came and did all the stuff we did. So we 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 went with campy tropes for our characters, and we didn't tell the storyteller what we were doing. Okay, okay. Um, and in fact, for that game, we did uh, the overall arc was uh, our characters were actually a play on the original Ghostbusters. Mm. So we had the trope. So that's how we were playing our characters. Uh, and at the end, like we did things in game that were jokes on that. But we were a and d party and it was basically a dungeon crawl. But it was a nice story and it was – Sure. It was simple. It was great to follow. It was, I, it was basically beer and you know pretzels with friends around a campfire kind of thing. Right, right. And we got to the end of it and we, we brought it up to the storyteller and he's like, oh my god, I never caught that. But that's hilarious and he thought it was funny and it was great. Mm-hmm. And then we went and did – uh, Shadow Run, and for that we troped up our characters to the A team because right. we figured, hey, you know, best case scenario, it's just the four of us. Worst case scenario, we got a bunch of other people involved with us, and we'll just have fun with it. And it was terrible. There were, I think, eight people at the table, mm-hmm. and the storyteller literally was on hard rails and trying to make it campy and funny and slapsticky. In a very serious environment. Yeah, it's like hard cyberpunk. It's like right, you know. and and but it was basically we were playing a we were being railroaded through an Austin Powers movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, seriously, it was that it was really awkward. In the grim so, future of 2075, the future is wacky. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, like <laughs> he made jokes about the fact that they're like without making a joke of it that it was a giant. Uh, a mountain base with a huge hangar door, like metal hangar door. We're like, what is this? Like, we thought we were breaking into a bio, you know, a were biology there sharks institute. with freaking laser yes. beams. Yes, there was a super villain, or a superhero who shows up, and he ended up dying some weird death, and like w- that we kind of caused. I mean, it was terrible. It was, and plus he was acting like he was the greatest storyteller ever, you know, so. How much time do we have left? Uh, we got about 50 minutes. I yeah. think 48 of that is going to be me sighing. All right. We're done with this part. <laughs> Anywho, so what we're basically saying, what we're trying to say mm. is that stories are told and by storytellers telling these in this these, these fashions change. 
Like I've changed my style oh, yeah. a few times. Yeah, my, my style's changed. Sometimes a you lot. need to just back off and be like, you know what? I'm just doing a, a dungeon run on this one because mm-hmm. I've got nothing in me to try and make this like Game of Thrones. Yep. You know, I just want, I need simplicity, and so I'm going to go simple. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just recognizing those differences. And I think, like when we when we look at our Discord and we see some of our our people mm-hmm. on our Discord who we love, uh, talking about how they're running four to six games in the course of a month, they're oh, different. God. Yeah, like my mind goes, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> how, how, what? How? <laughs> like that's that's a lot of paperwork to keep. But if you're running them simply. Yeah, like, and I'm not saying simply in a negative way. No, Don't no, get no, me no, wrong no. on that and, at all. Look, I, I think it's, I think it's important to just diverge real yeah, okay. quick, right okay. here and now, yeah. and just issue, issue the disclaimer. We're going to do an awful lot of talk about different storytelling styles, and I want it on the board right now. Neither Rob nor I feel like any of your fun is wrong. Not in like, the least. If 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 pizza Weird. if pizza and beer D and D night is how you guys get down, then I am very happy for you. That do it. That like it's not how I get down. Sometimes but, it's hard for me to get to that level. In right, fact, we right. were talking like, about. I kind of wish I could calm down a little bit about it. You know, <laughs> you gotta, like, taking it from an eleven to a seven is challenging. That, at times. Well, that, well, that's actually how this whole discussion got started. How this whole topic got started because I, I was, we were talking about that party metaphor. You know, and mm-hmm. and I was saying like I, I think I'm one of those people who would like. I don't know how to calm down and run a one shot. Like I hear people talking about their pizza and beer D and D nights and just having a great time and like, oh, it's all goofy and you know, sometimes you know, so, and people are talking about how they drink during them, and I'm like, you let your players drink during your games, right? Like how how could you could, you know? Because for me, it's a very serious thing. Like yeah, I am I am curating a story for you. I am sitting down. I am I'm spending a month writing this. I am putting blood, sweat, tears, and money into you know building terrain and 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 all this jazz. You know, three D printing miniatures so that we have the appropriate things. And I'm using proxies or anything like that. I'm painting them. Uh, you know. And and I'm not saying I'm I you know I feel like anybody's being ungrateful or anything like that. That's not what I'm getting at. But yeah, that's the level of energy I put into my game. So there's a jarring sort of thing for me when I hear people say, "Oh yeah, you know, we just we we pop we popped a case of beer. There's eight of us. We don't even care if we get through the story, whatever." Right. And I could rem- and when we started talking about that, I was trying to remember back to when I was young, um, when I first started playing games. <laughs> And we were building our own little games and just running them. It mm-hmm. was very light because yeah. we, you know, for we didn't know what we were doing very well. Sure, sure, sure. And we were just trying to figure out storytelling and things like that, and, and making something interesting. And it was very light like that. I was just kind of doing random things, mm-hmm. you know, because my my idea was that there was a objective, and the players got to the objective, and when they got to the objective, that objective was done, and that was the end of the night. Yeah, you know, kind of yep. a thing. My my first games were very much like that too. Yeah, yeah, and. I miss that simplicity because my brain doesn't let me go that – like I get – far. like I'm trying to get back to this one campaign that I have not ran in a long time uh-huh. and I find it exceptionally challenging to just be simple in it. To just calm down yeah. and just put some bad guys on the board. Exactly, and, exactly. Yeah. So like to get kind of through this because we have some notes that are actually helping me a little bit here. We've kind of got these – Two things that we talk about, you know, when we talk about basic mechanics when it, of a story, you've got the hack and slash mechanics and the free form mechanics. And sometimes they work in conjunction with each other in a story and sometimes it's one or the other. Mm-hmm. And I think it's up to the storyteller to kind of figure out what the players want before that. But oh, yeah. yeah. I don't think there's a – like when I talk – I've talked to other people and I've I've gone through a couple of different things. I said, do you ever find out from your storyteller before you go to a story what it's going to be like? And they're like, what do you mean? Like when they say they're going to run, you know, uh, I don't know, Shadowrun or they're going to run, you know, World of Darkness or something like, no, I just I just play. Like, so you don't know whether it's a story kind of RP game or you don't know if it's going to be a hack and slash right. game. They're like – well, I know my story. T- I, I I know the DM. Mm-hmm. So this, this is what he does. And I'm like, you know, I'm cocking my head I mean, like, that's, okay. That's part of it. It's kind of a, so is it some, knowing some... your storyteller? Is that just the way things are? So, I mean, I'm throwing this kind of out to the Discord. After you guys listen to this, you know, I want to kind of talk about like who we are as storytellers and do we stick to a line? And do we do that because of our players? Right. Or right. do we do that just because that's how we've always done it? 
No, well, that's true. And 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 would it would it be jarring to you if your storyteller you know threw you a curveball? Right. Have you thrown yourself a curveball? Have you forced yourself into new pockets at times? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you know. So I I, th- I think that's that's definitely a discussion that you kind of need to have with your storyteller just to make sure that everybody's still on the same page. Because, I mean, yeah, there's a there's a level of of trust you definitely build up with your friends, with your mm-hmm. storytellers and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But, um, would would that be a bit a bit of a betrayal? You know, I mean, Could it you, yeah. you, you kind of know what you're getting when you show up to one of my games. You know, you're going to get a, a spoonful of gritty realism. You're going to get a mm-hmm. spoonful of, uh, uh, of of cinematics and, mm-hmm. and, and whatnot like that. And it's going to be a, a pretty big but pretty straightforward storyline. Yeah, I would say. Whereas mine tend to be a spoon, a little bit more than a healthy spoonful of cinematics, a lot of movement to scene. You yeah. know, where we, yep. you know, I, I will make the assumption that you guys traveled the three days to wherever, you know, <laughs> just to get to where we're going. And then on top of that, I might throw a lot of um, heroism mm-hmm. and, 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 uh, and, 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 and tropey villainy. Yeah. To a degree. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, you, you like a lot of black and white in your, your heroes and villains yeah. and stuff like that. I like black hats and white hats yeah. and uh, your occasional gray people who get thrown in the mix who help you help make a decision for. So, you know? like, if I showed up to one of your games, though, yeah. and I'm thinking, like, oh, well, you know, I know Rob. I mean, mm-hmm. Rob's going to, Rob's going to run a game like this, you know? Yeah. And then all of a sudden it was just nothing but hack and slash combat. Yeah. I'd be like, why are we even here? Oh, because it's a dungeon. Right, right, but like, okay, so who owns the dungeon? What's what's the, little... <laughs> you know what, Sarah? I didn't even write any of that stuff. I'm gonna be dead honest with you. It's just a dungeon. There's some ogres in it. You want to go kill the ogres? Kill the ogres, Sarah. Like, I'd be really thrown off by that game. I would feel, <laughs> I would feel very betrayed by that. You know, fair enough. Okay, okay. So you're on the betrayal side. See, like, if you decided that uh, in the game that I'm currently in, you decided mm-hmm. to just straight up throw a dungeon crawl in, I would accept it as like. Well, I guess, I guess she just felt like we needed to go murder some goblins, and I mean, that's great. Don't get me wrong; I've got dungeon crawls. Oh, I know you do. Planned into the but game, but I don't expect your dungeon crawls to be like a traditional dungeon crawl. But you are going to be able to ask some hard questions about why my dungeon is laid out the way that it is. It will have an ecology. Yep. <laughs> the first dungeon it will have crawl. A history. The first dungeon crawl we went on, uh-huh. there were th- questions to be asked. Sure. I mean, we sure. had we had goblins in the gun- dungeon. That I was concerned why they were there. Mm-hmm. That's not typical. There aren't storyteller. There, there aren't players out there who are like, oh yeah, we just got in this dungeon. There are five. You come across a group of five goblins, you know, hunkered down behind a barricade. I kill them all. Okay, great. You've moved in the next room. You don't ask yourself why those goblins were there and what were they doing in that room. You know, <laughs> they found a bunch of loot and they're hanging out there. Oh, mm-hmm. they killed three adventurers. Great. Okay, we'll move on. What? Do, What's going on with those adventures? Yeah. Like I know Sarah has names for all of those people. Oh, yeah. And the stuff that's in their pockets as meaningful. Oh, yeah. You know, those things are the difference there. And I think in a – in that f- RP and hack and slash design, we throw those layers on top mm-hmm. of of meta and history and tiebacks mm-hmm. that are – I guess like the toppings, if you will. Sure. And that's where we get into that mixed story where it's like, yeah, it is just beer and pizza with friends, but you throw it, a, 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 you know, an MF and charcuterie board. Right. Your yes. idea of simple, like if you really, you, you were like, I'm just going to do a simple party. I'm just going to do a simple party. I'm cutting cheese and meats. So I'm like, no, I'm going to do that. I could have just gone to Pizza Hut, but I handmade the pizza myself yeah. and it's Asiago cheese. Yeah. And- <laughs> you know, and you would feel bad. You would actually tell us. You'd be like, I didn't make my own dough. I I got pre-made dough. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sorry, guys. Yeah, I, I just, I, I was running low on time, and I just, I, I bought a pre-made crust. You know, or I, I got a bag of mozzarella. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it was pre. I just didn't want to hurt my knuckles anymore. So, right. but you would tell us, and that's the thing. Yeah. Like, even in a campaign, I've, I've had those conversations with you. You'd be like, I totally just sixed out of this one, and I did this because I, I just, I didn't know what to do, so I just, I rolled up some stuff. But now I actually have stories, and then you add, you're like, and now yeah. I have stories behind each one of those pieces. You know. <laughs> I have a reason why they were there, regardless if it was necessary. So I think that's I think that's important to know mm-hmm. 
for storytellers is like to know your style, know what your players are expecting so that you don't, you know, betray them. But at the same time, have that conversation with them. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess that's another question to Discord. Like, do you have conversations with your players about this kind of stuff? Well, I'm 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 reminded of a uh, conversation I had with uh, with Technolich actually. Oh, okay. Um, because we're we're friends on Facebook, hmm. and uh, this was uh, fraternizing. Well, no, it was it was, it was long <laughs> it was actually yeah long it was before, before long before we ever started yeah. the podcast. No, it's fine. And uh, uh, he was um, uh, I think he think he'd seen some references to Critical Role or something like that, mm-hmm. and I was or or was was asking about like live play D&D games or something like that and and or just kind of openly didn't even reference Critical Role and I said oh well you know you should check out Critical Role it's really good it's you know professional voice actors sure, yeah. and really good production quality you know and I think you'll enjoy it mm-hmm. and um so he he listened to a couple episodes or watched them or whatever and uh kind of came back and was like ugh no and I was like what do you what do you what do you mean ugh no like I, you're literally the first and only person I've ever seen look at Critical Role and go ugh no yeah. And he's like, this guy's too serious. This, this guy's take 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 D and D way too seriously. I I can't hang with these guys. And it kind of caught me back. Like I was like, what do you mean they're too serious for you? Like this is this is what D and D is supposed to be like. Like this is kind of what I look at, and I think like wow, you know, like I I I want to be Matthew Mercer, you know, when I grow up. And we all want to make money playing games. I want to be a professional dungeon master and do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but no, but but seriously, the, the the amount of production value that he puts into it, no, is, it for, for me is personally inspiring. It's inspiring, and and so I was initially taken back, and I was like, what do you what do you mean? Ugh, no, and, you know what do you mean? He, he he takes it too seriously. Like, how do you not take it that seriously? And mm-hmm. I I had a moment of personal reflection where I was like, oh wow, that was a really like I suppose privileged thing to say of me. You know, like I it was really you know. I was really up my own butt on that one. Can I, I can I flip didn't the script realize on you that for you? there were people that had different outlooks on how to play D and D than me. You know, well, music. Yeah, like you literally just said, "Oh, check out this opera." I don't know about opera. Opera's a great kind of music. Oh, I do like music. Right, but Checks I'm really into, th- but I'm really out. into eighty speed metal right well, now. But so. the thing <laughs> is, is, he doesn't tell you he's into eighty speed metal, and you're like, "Oh, that's fantastic." You know, I've heard this thing, and so then he goes listen to opera, and you're like, "He's just like, yeah, that's totally not my thing." Why? I just don't get into that. How could you not? It's too serious. Too serious. Right. Like, what the heck do you listen to? There are layers of composition. Exactly. The, the, the composer and the the interplay of strings versus versus woodwinds and like, yeah, dude. Like, in, unless it's 180 B- BPM, I'm not. You yeah. Know, yeah. I can't. I'm sorry. Hang. Have you listened to Daft Punk recently? <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> but that's the thing is, it's just it's a different style, and sometimes you're not sure, so you've kind of got to figure out where mm-hmm. it fits in, but. All right. So we talked a little bit about like like hack and slash versus RP based, you mm-hmm. know, throwing your 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 dungeon crawl versus your like sprawling Game of Thrones manipulated, you know, political manipulation stories like Vampire I think plays very similar to that, you know. It can definitely. Uh, well, it, it's it, it lends itself it to it. It should. I th- I think that was the intended g- game design. Okay. Yeah, I can um, see that. Urban Shadows Urban Shadows is very much not a hack and slash. Yeah, I think like its combat section is like a page long and is very not well described. I'd use the word weak. Weak. But it's meant to be weak. It's yeah, because they're so. like they're like, look, you shouldn't be focusing on this, so we're not even gonna write rules for it. Yeah, we're gonna I mean, yeah. So so yeah, it does I think it definitely lends to it or inf- or informs you of the right direction, which comes back to mm-hmm. like when you're gonna run a game and you you hear from your players that they want to do something combat heavy, but they want to do something in a dark you know, gre- grooting kind of gritty world where there's you know supernatural things. You got to find a system that's gonna that's gonna work with. Sure, sure. So, um, but what about like um, what about campaign style? Like, st- like okay. So we're talking things like uh, episodic games, one shots <laughs> versus like your big meta. Like, this, it's gonna take four years to tell this story. Yeah, I mean that's I, I think that definitely is something that has to be discussed. Mm-hmm. Um I I think I now would have more trouble running a one shot. I don't yeah. think I would be very comfortable building and running a one shot. I would do too much. And I there's a lot of stuff that I go back to in a short story sense. Like mm-hmm. it, it's almost comforting to go read a short story to see how it's written. Just so that I can run a one shot. Yep. 
because you don't need to tell an entire story. You need to tell a perspective or a moment in history. Mm -hmm. You know, you watch something like Doctor Who where you've got this epic kind of character and these epic moments and there's this huge backstory and yet one episode should stand alone. And that's sometimes challenging to do when you have rich history and depth and this this need to write more. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Um you And that that's really my problem with one shots is mm-hmm. that I I feel like I need to explain everything. I feel like I need to give perspective. I feel like I feel like those goblins in the dungeon need a reason to be in the dungeon. Yeah. And the adventurers that they killed, like they they don't just have treasure. They have to have dead adventurers who had treasure on them that brought the plus one short sword in there because goblins wouldn't just be tooling around with a plus one short sword in a box conveniently located behind their barricades. Mm-hmm. So now I got to tell a story about this back of it. You know, you you do, or they're literally corpses. Exactly, just and so now skeletal you, corpses. And and I I don't know how to calm down. I don't know how to not make a whole pizza by myself. You know. <laughs> Sometimes you just have to look at what you got and dial it back and that's hard. And episodics are important and I think they're – I think if you can do them well, mm-hmm. you you have a gift. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I and mean I, I envy the, the, the storytellers who can in a four to six hour game session have a – have fantastic moments and an episodic feel that it feels concise and closed. Mm -hmm. Like you get to the end and you're like, I feel accomplished or I feel like we made it to a milestone or a point. And that is challenging as hell. Yeah, you were were, were talking briefly about uh, future episode ideas and uh, Rob brought up uh – Hey, let's let's talk about the art of the one shot. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, like, I don't have anything to contribute to the discussion. <laughs> you do, though. You do. Like, I would I would love for someone to teach me. <laughs> no, I think I think there is I think there's a lot that we both can contribute uh, because we're not good. Oh, that's fair. That's fair. We could uh, so. have a long discussion about our failings in that area. Totally. And I'm not saying that you know a campaign <laughs> is just a series of of <laughs> I won't say failed one shots, but or failed uh, episodes. Mm-hmm. It's not like the it's it's not the oh the bad guy got away again. Like that's that's kind of an old way of looking at it, right? You right. know, or oh this this lead didn't get us to a destination. It got us to another red herring that we've checked off the list, and now we must move on. You know, that's that's kind of a uh, I think a cop out. Um, I think that a campaign is an overarching story. Mm-hmm. That has beats in it that make sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and I, I like. I think there's there's just three three major ways you can go about that. Like mm-hmm. you can do your just series of one shots where like right. literally you're just completely disconnected from the last game. Anyone can show up, and I think that's that's a cool way to do things because yeah. you know if you do have like attendance issues where someone has to bow out, like it doesn't matter. Right. You know, you're not missing anything if you're. If your 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 things are completely disconnected from one another, mm-hmm. it's just you're using the same characters in the same world. We're just doing a one shot again, right? And that's like truly episodic episodic play. On the far end of your spectrum, you you've got your 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 major over over uh, overarching campaigns where you know it does take you three years just to tell a single story. But there's a there's a kind of a sweet spot in the middle, mm-hmm. um, which is what I would call burn notice uh, 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 storytelling. Um, if you're familiar with that show, yes. Um, every episode was kind of its own job, yeah. And it it, it told a succinct one shot, but the beginning and ending of the episode always tied into whatever the larger meta plot of that. Right. They always devoted like ten minutes at the beginning, ten minutes at the end, but it was an hour long episode, so mm-hmm. the whole like forty minutes in the middle was all one shot, right? Um. You might get introduced to a you know recurring character or something like that there, but it, but what was going on had nothing to do with the meta. And I think that for those of you who know Shadowrun, Shadowrun is the perfect episodic system. Oh, it's great because because they are jobs. Correct, but you can insert in there a story that comes through either that the Johnson is leaving you through your your material version of yourself, if you will, that storyteller sitting at the table being the Johnson giving out the job. You know, you literally have a quest giver. It's kind of crazy. Um, but in that same regard, 
there are bits of information that bleed through like your initial job for going into you know an Aries biotech facility mm-hmm. to steal something that they have but you you find out in that job that it's not Aries tech that you're stealing it's actually you know you know uh this other side company Yakatomi and mm-hmm. you're like what's Yakatomi you got to do <gasps> dun, it dun, dun. and actually you're not stealing it for Yakatomi to get it back to them you're stealing it for a whole nother group mm-hmm. you know and all of this is ends up being, you know, uh, intrigue to try and direct a political campaign, you know, for a rival. Sure. You know, or, and all of that could be part of these short little stories that give you little bits of insight till eventually your players are like, yeah, we're not going to the Johnson today. We're going to go do this thing. Mm-hmm. You're going to go what? And suddenly the story goes in another direction. Yeah. Because the Cause players. This is the third time this company has messed us over. Exactly. And we're going to, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Or, you know, or you completely flip the table and you, they walk into the bar to go see the Johnson and he has a bullet in his head. Mm-hmm. And you're like, uh oh. So, but that's the thing is, is that those kinds of systems can sometimes give you a different perspective. Yep. On how you move through an episode and how to get episodes moving in a larger campaign setting. You can start with something episodic, something simple, a quest giver, if you will, sure. and then take it from that point and shift it forward into a more larger campaign setting. And you don't even have to let your – you know, get your players in early. Mm-hmm. You can literally just have a couple episodes that are just – that's it. They're episodes. Yep. There's no tie together. They're just that. Yep. You know, they're quick one shots. They're simple little things. Go do this thing. Go take out the rats out of the cellar. You know, it's the the classic RPG. Oh, help me. There's rats in my cellar. I mean, but you guys play Bard's Tale. I love you all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's those kind of moments that get you into that first quest, that first design that lets you start moving through that episodic feel. Right. right. So – and we'll, we'll come back to that because we're going to talk a little bit more I think next next episode about campaign design. Um, we're going to start talking yeah, about start. Campaign. Yeah, start. God, it's going to be long. There's a lot to unpack there. You had talked about – and this is <laughs> – we actually kind of gotten a minor – I'm not going to say fight. No, 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 no. It was it was it was a misunderstanding of what we were talking about. Um, uh, typically, we 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 do a uh, uh, kind of a pre-show where we'll kind of go through our show notes and, and not really do like a mock show or anything like that, but like just really kind of it's spitballing, spitballing what what we wrote, what we've both collectively written in our show notes, and, yeah, and yeah, go yeah. back and forth over it. Yeah. And uh, so I wrote the words gritty realism. Yes, and um, you had an opinion about it and, in there and, too. Uh, and, I, and I stated my opinion about gritty realism, and uh, Rob wrote a big like, "Well, I don't think your opinion is quite on target because of all this stuff here." And we kind of went back and forth a little yeah. bit in the show notes, like leaving notes for each other in the margins of our <laughs> of yes. our Google Doc, <laughs> which, by the way, I think is fantastic to do. Oh, uh, but it. what it came down to is that it was a misunderstanding on the term gritty realism. Gritty realism, yeah. You know, and I thought that when you said D and D really doesn't give you agency to do gritty realism. It doesn't. And I'm like, well yeah, it does. I mean you can you can be inches from death in in D and D constantly in a war torn area. You can totally have that. And that's not in your mind what right. you were going for. So gritty realism my 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 counter argument to that was gritty realism is not um being in dangerous situations because pretty much every every role playing game is going to probably put you in some sort of you know dangerous situation. That's yeah, what you, that's what breeds conflict and that's yeah. what breeds drama. You click it from CR rating five to CR rating six, and suddenly it's dangerous. Yeah, yeah, and certainly you shit know. gets real, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's not that's not gritty realism because no. in D and D D and D assumes that it, at least you know the, the whole the whole basis of the role playing game, the whole system itself assumes that you are a hero, right? And it gives you all sorts of heroic abilities and eventually, even if it's not today, eventually, let me tell you about the time that I almost got incinerated by a great elder red dragon is a story your character could potentially tell. I almost survived today. You know, those kind of things. I almost got killed by an elder red dragon, but don't worry. My buddy the cleric has his god on speed dial and called in divine intervention. That's not gritty realism. No. No, no. Gritty realism to me is having to worry about like, OK, you guys are in the wilderness. What are you doing to find water? Mm-hmm. Make a survival check. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, so the temperature is going to drop a bit tonight. Let's make constitution saving throws to see if you get hypothermia. 
Yeah. Who's and that's, your, who here? Check, check your inventory list. Do you have cold weather gear? Yeah. And I've read some campaigns, some D&D mm-hmm. campaigns where player – where storytellers have cranked it up mm-hmm. who definitely do it. Like there was one that I was reading about where he literally went through and created a game session where the players were struggling to survive – Across the tundra. It was just their trip Mm -hmm. from one place to another place. But because they decided to go to the mountains, he made it basically a survivor mission. Yeah, absolutely. And they were trying to hunt. They had to use all their skills. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of a weird twist on your typical social campaign. We're like, okay, now that we're not in the dungeon and we're in the city, we've got to use our social skills and use those social skills to survive and, you know, work our way through the politics. No, no, no. This was we're in the mountains. Okay, so uh, are you? Do you guys have any rations? N- no. Okay. Well, um, tonight you're going to start starving. So if you don't find food <laughs> uh, by tomorrow, mm-hmm. you will take you, you'll you'll start declining in health. Mm-hmm. And they're like, "Oh crap!" You, you'll take a point of fatigue, and you will continue to take a point of fatigue until you get rations and can. Take or, care of yourself. Or until you die. You right. Know, that's a possibility too. That's and, on the table. And he was like – they literally had to work on that. And mm-hmm. so they were using their survival skills. They were using other skill sets. They had to go find wolves and ambush them. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, They had to find water because at one point they were so high in the peaks that there was literally just snow. And they were like, OK, well, we need to start a fire. And they're like, well, the spellcaster has fatigue and hasn't slept. Mm-hmm. He, he has no spells. So we can't just make fire. Yeah, it's like, uh oh, <laughs> and suddenly things got real. Yeah, exactly. So it was. He said though, the, and the players loved it. They absolutely loved mm-hmm. the adventure over the mountain. And by the time they got to town, they were like, oh, for God's sakes, we're so glad we're here. And they, you know, they they recovered themselves and got. But they were in a totally different mind frame. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, and and I I think that that I mean that sounds exciting to me. Yeah, because I do like a healthy spoonful of gritty realism in my games. Right. Um. Some of the best time I've ever had actually playing uh, Skyrim. Right. On PC, I, I downloaded a bunch of a uh, bunch of realistic survival yeah. mods, and uh, just trying to get from I think it was uh, Windhelm, no, sorry, uh, Winterhold to Windhelm um, in that uh, that game, um, and survive the blistering cold, not get hypothermia. I literally staggered into Windhelm, like <laughs> the, like the the game started blurring my vision. Yeah, I was like a hair's breadth from freezing to death. I wandered into a shop that had a blazing fire in it, and I was like, <gasps> the shop was like. You can buy anything you want, and I'm like, I just don't, don't, fire. don't care, just warm, warm, <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. warm. <laughs> you know, and that was exciting gameplay for me, but that was something I asked for, right? You know, I knew what I was getting into, and so I think again, this is a, gritty realism is another one of those situations where I think if I, um, like, if you threw that at us in one of your Seventh Sea games, oh god, yeah, like I one, would of the, be, one of the I would the sea be fights, yeah, blindsided by yeah. it because. You are you are the person who you know tries to put a dash of cinematics in yours, and the cap falls off of it, and you dump half of the thing in. Yeah. Um. You know. So if if it suddenly came down to okay, well now you're in the wilderness and you're starving and you're. I'd, it'd be on a boat for, without a doubt. It'd be on a boat. You guys would. <laughs> you're without rations. There's no wind. You're at sea. What do you do? No. You see, know? but but again, in seven seat, like I would expect that. Right. Sure. But like uh, suddenly making it like the Bear Grylls experience mm-hmm. in 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 the middle of a cinematic game, yeah, I'd be a little thrown by that. Yeah, I mean, okay. I'd I'd roll with it. Oh yeah, yeah. But I'd still be I'd still be like, what the hell is he doing? What, like, what, when are the ninjas going to jump out of the uh, out of the wilderness and yeah. you know jump us? You know, when when does Count Rachelu you know suddenly appear and hold us at rapier point and you yeah. know? Or when do I when does this all dissolve and I'm actually being tortured? Right, you know? right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, I get that. I get that. Uh, so you're so in short, like I think I I, I want to say that most of what we're kind of getting at here is the fact that you have to communicate with your players, and mm-hmm. I think that I don't know how many storytellers do on a regular basis. I would think more, yeah, but I find that I, I I'm finding more and more people say they don't. No, the players find a storyteller who fits the style they want to play. Less of the storyteller finds players. Yeah, I could, I could go with that, and then then does a little crafting, you know. But but, but I think but I, well, I think there's a lot of nonverbal communication going on there, though. Okay. I mean, because because what, what I'm hearing is I didn't talk to my storyteller because I already know my storyteller, right? 
you know. And there's a chance that the storyteller may throw you a curveball. But there's right. already kind of been that agreement of like, look, I'm playing Rob's game because I like Rob's game. Right. You know. Right. I like his style. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, you know? I, I, I listen to Sting because I listen to the police, you know. Right. And, and right. I know what to expect. But there's a big difference between the police and Sting. Mm-hmm. You know, just as much as you look through any of Prince's stuff, you know, he worked with a lot of different people, but he had a style and he had a feeling that went along with Mm -hmm. that. Um, I mean, there was – you could say that with a lot of different artists. So I think just as music, you kind of have to – if you're going to present something to someone and say, hey, join this group or hey, would you like to be part of my story? There has to be a certain sense of understanding more than just we're playing D&D. Yeah, yeah. Or Absolutely. we're playing seven C, but I think that does help as a framing to start with. And and even even game, you know, because the game will dictate style a lot mm-hmm. too. Yeah. You know, seven so, I mean, C is written for heroics. Right. It's written for cinematic plays, so you're not really going to get that 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 survival thing popping up just simply because the rules for seven C don't support it. Not traditionally, you know? no. And like uh, uh, a while back, I was I was bouncing around the idea of doing a one shot for Dread. Mm-hmm. And I know I asked a, a, a good handful, my boyfriend included, um, of of people who were just, you know, typically my, my gaming stable. Yeah, yeah. When I said, you know, hey, you know, you're usually in the rest of my games. You're in my D&D game. Would you like to play Dread? And uh, surpri- it was actually surprising to me. People were like, nah. Yeah. What do you mean, nah? Yeah. Like, you were thirsting to play D&D with me. Why wouldn't you want to play D, you know, why wouldn't you play Dread? Because I don't like horror games. Yeah. Oh. Well, actually, that's a great answer. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I honestly don't like that level of suspense personally. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I think it's neat to watch. Like, I might sit with popcorn and watch a bunch of players play it. Yeah, but I don't want to. Like, I, I'm sorry. I I'd rather have like fun. Yeah, like or be released yes. and have have some other situation go on versus being constantly in a level of stress about what's going to happen next. But that but. It's not everybody's cup of tea. Some sure. people like that roller coaster. Sure. You know? So. But, you know, it was definitely good. It was a good conversation to have to have. And yeah. it offered me that perspective of like, well, you know, maybe that maybe maybe games aren't always, you know, one one RP game isn't equa- equivalent to another. Yeah. You know, especially when you've got a major genre shift in it like that. So. Yeah. I think because I know a while back we did, at least I did in the past, uh, questionnaires to my players before I started a game. Oh yeah, and yeah, I would, yeah. I would ask all kind of, like, do you want more role play? Do you want more of this? Yeah, what do you I want this stuff? Those. You do know, like a Google forums or something yeah. like that. You'd send and I found that was it, yeah. it was helpful for me. But like even today, I would say there were things in that questionnaire I would have changed mm-hmm. just to get a better feel for where things were at. Right, so, right. Have we kicked this topic I, hard? I think we have. Um, kind of looking over our notes, and it looks like uh, looks like we kind of hit the bottom of them here. So okay. So uh, throwing back out to the Discord and those people who listen to this after the fact, uh, think about your play styles, like what you what you present to your players. You know, are you – what kind of parties do you throw? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And there's, there's been a lot of great discussion on the Discord already, a lot of mm-hmm. it that uh, oh, yeah. you know, kind of it kind of inspired this topic to begin with. So yeah. thank you all for all the discussion you're already having and uh, we'd love to see some some more thoughts on this. Yep, and we'll be moving into uh, our our next week's topic is going to be – about designing campaigns and, and episode episodes and one shots. And we're going to start picking away at the mountain. Mm-hmm. See if we can get through at least some of it at some level. So you want to do some, uh, some questions from discord. I know we got like four. Yeah. So, well, I think some of those have multiple questions in there, so it'll be interesting. Um, go ahead. So I got, I got called out. You did get called out I by Knox. Out by Knox in the box. Uh, as Sarah, did I remember you saying that you played a game while you were on vacation? Is travel tabletop a thing? Does it work for car rides, train rides? How would that even work? Are there techniques and accessories that would make that easier? Um, yes, you did. You mm-hmm. did remember me saying mm-hmm. that. Um, uh, traditionally, actually, we we play D and D, kind of like a, a one shot short yeah. campaign, sort of just mess around thing when we go up north for our annual. No, you didn't run it. No, I didn't run it this year. Um, yeah. Typically, it's uh, it's either Sean or his friend Dan uh, will run it. And uh, we've bounced around to a couple different game systems. The last couple times it's been D&D. But, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. That's uh, D&D up north uh, while we're camping is a thing. Um, we generally just pack the books and bring those up. Uh, you know, ultimately, d and is not difficult to play, um, you know, c- compactly. 
Uh, I've, I've absolutely uh, – I, I have actually played during car rides before. Um, I have uh, – I've seen you – know, I've heard of other people playing during car rides, so I know I'm not just the freak in the room. I, I mean I am the freak in the room, but not because of this. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, really all you kind of need is like uh, a, a few dice – um, a maybe a box lid or something like that that you can roll into, yeah, uh, to keep them from going all over the place. And uh, if a couple of other people have character sheets, uh, that's great. D and D Beyond actually makes it really super portable if you're playing Fifth Edition, yeah. Um, but you know, really, it, but that's you know, like I said, just for D and D. So if you're playing something else, your character sheet is just a piece of paper. Yeah, I think there would be some systems that would definitely make it easier mm-hmm. to play on the road. Um. Even driving. I mean, give an example. You're taking a 19 hour car ride down to Florida. Mm-hmm. You know, you could probably get in quite a bit of a game. You can get a ton of DD in there, yeah. Yeah. Or or any number of other systems that are diceless. Uh, but basically, you just want to make sure you don't distract the driver too much. Mm-hmm. And uh, your storyteller, I mean, you're, you're, you're probably going to have to opt for more of a. Um, you know, theater of the mind's eye. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not going to be able to pull up miniatures and maps and mm-hmm. terrain and stuff like that. So a lot of it's going to be descriptive. You're going to yep. be leaning on those skills. You probably don't want to make it too involved because, you know, getting really super into character when you have to pay attention to like, which is my exit coming up? Yeah. And stuff like that um, is, you know, probably, probably tell a little, little simpler of a story, more one shot based. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, really not tough. Yeah. Not really tough. Good answer. Good answer. Oh, also, uh, you saw Mad Elf's discussion there, right? He would play a game on the train. Oh, with his yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's a great no, way of doing is, it. And great, there's no driver. Yes. You got a nice table. You know, you and could I, actually. I th- it sounds like a really cool idea. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and I saw Overwatch's bad pun on there. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. And featuring the one too, because yes. Snick's on a train. train. Yeah, solid <laughs> Snick. Yes. All right, so technically, let's head another question. Okay. Uh, have you ever found yourself changing storytelling mid campaign or mid adventure? Uh, a good cin- cinematic example of this is from Dust Till Dawn. I agree, it's a good one. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say yes, I definitely have. Um, <laughs> I've tried to not do as cinematic as I normally do and then end up doing it anyways. I've also gone and rolled that back. I think my last 7C game became less cinematic and more uh, – it adjusted more to a – I would do something at the beginning and I would do something at the end. But during the session, I would just let things move and let the players describe the scenes Mm -hmm. as they came through. And I think for me, yeah, I would do that. I think style-wise, like in a Dust Till Dawn kind of way, I don't think I've ever done a hard shift where it's like, ooh, we're doing this intrigue game. And then suddenly the intrigue game suddenly becomes a murder mystery. Like I've never done that. I think it would be interesting. But I think it would also be jarring for the players. I think it would be very jarring for the players. Yeah. Again, I think that's one of those ones where, like, you you would almost feel a little cheated or betrayed by it. Um, it would be something you may want to c- communicate to your players. Well, this goes back to what we were talking about, like, my idea for doing a betrayal in the game. Yeah. Like, that right there, you even said, like, that would throw me the fuck out. Like, I might not want to play that game. Right. Like, I I would be seriously wondering at that point, like, hold on a second. We he were just doing this whole stabbed heist thing. the prince. Yeah. You know? and, and now all of a sudden it's, a, it's, it's vampires, you know, survival horror. And, right. like, I'm not – I'm not sure about this anymore. Like I, I kind of signed up for, you know, for a heist. Right. You know, not right. not survival. And I'm really wondering where the hell this even came from. You right. Know? Right. Or like if you're, you're fir- after your second game of Shadowrun, you're caught and put in prison. Mm-hmm. And now it's a prison game. Like that's very different. Yeah, it's it's, it's different because there was consequences that got you there. Yeah. Um. And from dusk till dawn, like I mean, you're he, you're technically correct on the whole. Um, Tonal shift of it. You are 100% correct on that. Right. Um, but I I would almost say that the the whole heist movie thing at the beginning was almost like misdirection. 100%. It was just it – just, it's, it's, it's background. A, it's background. It's a setup to yeah. get you into the survival horror part of it. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say it wouldn't be so bad if like, OK, we, we agree that we're going to play a hack and slash game. Right. And then the first session, we sit down and it's a state dinner with the with with the nobility mm-hmm. and a delicate uh, interplay of social politics on multiple levels of the royal structure of this kingdom. And you're like, I thought we were no, it's okay, Rob. 
be patient. Right. <laughs> when you get exiled to the dungeon, you'll understand. Right. Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah. Whereas like, you know, I, I would I would put another movie toward it that kind of – that did it in a jarring way for me and it wasn't until I literally just watched a review of it and that was uh, No Country for Old Men. When I saw the movie – Oh, yeah. I didn't like the movie. And when I saw the movie, I didn't like it either because – I was very much led in a direction in the movie and then right in the middle of the movie, the protagonist dies, like mm-hmm. literally off screen. And it just feels jarring. It feels like a dead stop and you're now telling a new story when that wasn't the story at all. You oh. missed the whole point of the story. And by the end of the movie, you're you're kind of like, wait, the bad guy gets away and the other guy good guy gives up yeah i didn't like it because there wasn't an ending right the, the, the movie had no climax to it like it was just... you're watching a movie called no country for old man men but you're not watching the old man walk through the story and that was the story and it mm. wasn't until i watched that review that i went oh i what well, i didn't realize every i missed it you know it was the it was the whole thing about that and i think that's where the disconnect comes in is, is that i had to be told what i missed yeah yeah and again, it's the storyteller telling, giving you, giving you a a riddle to solve, and the riddle isn't what's in the story; mm-hmm. it's what you're watching. Right, right. So, so much fun. All right, so we got a, we got a question from Overwatch here. Okay, uh, is style more about setting or genre or system? Uh, what aspects of a particular campaign determine your style? Are there any in, uh, intangible factors that come into play? Yes. That's a, oh, that's a, that's a huge question. I'm just going to say yes. That's my answer. <laughs> 42. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. So let's unpack this. Is style more about setting, genre, or system? Um, I think set, system definitely has a weight. Is style more about setting, genre, or system? It's genre. I, I agree. Genre has the biggest weight. It has the biggest weight there. Because um, let, let's just break this down. If I'm going to tell a moody, role play heavy, dis, you know, almost discussion heavy political drama about vampires, I am going to do it in White Wolf. Mm-hmm. Now, is it the system that's dictating that? Is it the genre that's dictating that? Because I could do the same thing in any. You know, I could do it in Seven C sure. system. Sure, and just add vampires. Mm-hmm. Nothing changes. Because we're not going to have combat, so the social cues and everything still fit. Mm-hmm. You know, I think part of it, besides genre and, and and setting in the system, determines how does your players want to play in it. Do they right. want to be heroic, or do they want to be gritty? Do you want to be predator or prey? This there you go. Yep. That was a perfect way of putting it. Yep. Do you want to be the predator or the prey? This is a story about vampires, but is it? We're going to hunt some vampires and throw some fireballs and level up. Okay, right. we're playing D&D. Do you want to be afraid of the vampires? Right. Then, no. Maybe it's Cthulhu. Maybe it's Cthulhu. Maybe you know, it's do you want to be Vampire on... Dark Age? Yeah, exactly, you know? exactly. I mean, you're still going to have heroic elements in that. Sure. That you're growing, but your growth is challenged. Sure. You know, um, and the leveling doesn't exist. We talked about that. Mm-hmm. So I think it does have it. What aspects of a particular campaign determine your style? Um, I would say your well, your your episode style, like how how you're going to be doling it out, how I, big it is. I think the game system in and of itself informs a lot of the style. Mm, I agree um, because it limits a lot of the stuff that you can and can't pull off. You know, like I said, D and D, you can't do gritty realism. Because because already right out of the bat as a first level fighter you're still a heroic character class. correct correct and and if you ever level up to second level well guess what you just got a boatload more hit points and weapon proficiencies and yep. you know you're twice start you have to work more at the system to get what you want out mm-hmm. of it exactly and you, and you shouldn't you shouldn't fight the system you should yeah. you should honestly pick a system that's that's good for you so um, definitely the 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 right out of the bat the game you pick determines the style of game you're going to be playing mm-hmm. with it. Um, and there are, are there any intangible factors that come into play? Um, a lot of it's about group composition, I think. I would say group composition and availability. Yeah. It's hard to play an intense game where you're you're sweating bullets if you only do it once a month. Yep. You know, it's it's hard to have a in-depth – like if you're doing a story about four people who are 
in a cabin in the woods and crazy shit's going on and you're trying to get them to remember what's going on to, t- to tell the story and you're only doing it for like four hours mm-hmm. once a month, there's a lot lost. Nobody's going to remember why they're invested in what's going on. Even and... if you're using like dread kind of rules. Yeah. So I I would say that would – the system does dictate that. But the intangible factor is when can you guys get together? Yeah. Yeah. So – and you won't know that until you pull your group and the group you start in a lot of times. That's true. That's so true. I would say that's definitely intangible. So good questions though. Good questions. Great questions. Yeah. All right. Yours, I think. Uh, favorite books to use as a game setting. Favorite movies to use as a game setting. <laughs> Uh, well, I'm glad he didn't ask video games because I'm already doing that one. Well, yeah, I would say Elder <laughs> Scrolls is a perfect uh, books. Um, so I, I'm going to answer this one actually on behalf of uh, of, of my boyfriend, mm-hmm. um, and that is going to be Wheel of Time and Mistborn. Okay. Um, he got me into both of those, mm-hmm. so I can't claim credit for either of them. Fair. Uh, but they are both very rich worlds. Mm-hmm. Um. Written by uh, uh, Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson, respectively. Yeah, they're beautiful. Um, beautiful game settings with with cool magic systems. Oh yeah, um, and a lot of a lot of a uh, uh, divergence from typical fantasy tropes. Yeah, I th- there are definitely things that have triggered in my mind. Like there's a lot of the steampunk stories that have been told. Like I love the Leviathan series. Oh, and Dresden. Sorry, I got to throw Dresden yep, in there. Dresden. Yep. yep, we'll get back to that one day. Mm-hmm. Um. But like the Leviathan series is neat because it's an alternative reality. Okay. Um, I don't know. Young, anything, I don't know anything about the, the, the Leviathan series. It's young adult, okay. uh, but it reads so beautifully and so well. Um, oh wait, wait, is that the uh, uh, his dark materials? materials? No, no. Okay, no. Leviathan is the um, is is a larger thing where basically you've got the uh, organic kind of scientists versus me- mechanical sciences. In the World War One setting, like World War One is about to break out, oh, and it's it's literally following uh, Ferdinand's son and another and Archduke, a gir- Archduke Ferdinand? Ferdinand's Ferdinand's son okay. who gets away with a few of his like men and makes it to the mountains of uh, effectively you know the the Dutch mountains, and then on the other side you have this young girl who gets into the Navy, which is an air Navy mm-hmm. that is run by a whole bunch of biologists, effectively, who's made blimps out of whales. Oh, wow. By doing genetic material changes. Oh, that sounds and awesome. So she's hiding out as a boy, uh-huh. basically, because she's she's an aeronaut and she's great at it. Mm-hmm. And their paths converge. Huh. And for three stories, you've got this epic story with – mechanics and biology you know biolo- biology and what's going on with them and them traveling the world basically and, and oh, through this whole thing awesome. it's it's a beautiful story and it's it's wonderfully well written um and it, it's fun it's popcorn but i really liked the way that they developed the world mm-hmm. it was simple little changes that made it kind of fantastical but it would be a neat world to go in i think for movies I would say it's straight up like I look at Seventh C and I I've pulled so many things that that it is that world. Oh, it yeah. is it yeah. is it is easily that world to go run around in. Um so yeah, I would I, I Man in the Iron Mask, Three Musketeers, uh, you know, uh Don Juan DeMarco, uh that type of of the falsehood of what that time period really was. Mm-hmm. That that renaissance era, if you will, um, and the beauty of it. I think those kind of lend themselves well to the Seventh Sea world. Um, so, yeah, I would say those for me. I'm going to throw you a curveball. What's that? So this is this is less a uh, of a favorite movie to sure. use as a game setting, more of a kind of a wish list. It's kind mm-hmm. of a thing that I've always had brewing in the back of my head and I've never known quite the group to do it for or quite the game system to use for it or anything sure. like that. But two film settings I've always wanted to use. Okay. Aliens? Okay. Cuz you could you could do a lot with that. Dread. Um yeah, but okay. So, so you could do Alien as as a, as a game of dread, sure. or you could do Aliens as more of a on the offensive, gritty mm-hmm. realism. You know, harsh, harsh world, harsh world, but shoot 'em up. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. Very that's, much a, so. that's a hack and slash campaign. Sure. Oh, yeah. That was. Yeah, you could tell that was a brutal hack and slash campaign. Yep. Um, and the other one, believe it or not, I, I grew up I grew up a trucker. Uh, and, Star Trek, yeah. Yeah. I've always wanted to kind of do Star Trek, but um, I was always a little disappointed by um, – the really bad choreography in their fights and I just thought that Klingons were really amped up in the lore to be so much bigger and badder than they ever actually were on screen. Yep. And uh, there's there's this part of me in the back that just kind of wants to say, you know, I, I would love to run a story or write my own movie or something that kind of corrects those things. And the new Star Trek movies have done a little bit of that, but I, I don't know how to feel about them. There's all kinds of of – I mean, you, you can dissect the Star Wars because I was going to ask you, like, which Star Trek do you like? Ignoring the movies, mm-hmm. which of the series did you like? And I think that dictates a lot more. Because they're all told in different stories. Uh, D- Deep Space Nine was my favorite series. There you go. So, yeah. We'll talk more about it. We'll get into that in the episode. No, yeah, it was right. objectively the best at me. Uh, at story to, uh, ST. No, I agree. Conclave. I agree. Fight yep. me. No. Nope, Come at me. <laughs> oh, I think we're ready to wrap up, though. Yeah, I think we are. Uh, right. So next week's topic, we're going to start unpacking the campaign. Sounds like a plan. How to go about doing that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. once again, you can find us at ST underscore Conclave on Twitter, uh, ST underscore Conclave on Instagram, and uh, look in the information link or uh, – Uh, the pinned tweet on our Twitter is the link to our Discord. We'd love for you to join us there. Join in the discussion. Toss us some questions for the show. Please do. Please do. And thank you to our Patreon members, Knox, Illy Mae, and Dave. Uh, We love you guys. We would love to see more of you on there and uh, help us keep these episodes flowing. And a brand new uh, techno lich too, right? That's, yeah, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Yep. Uh, Intro music is Beyond the Warriors by Gooey Frog. Uh, the outro music, which you're hearing now, is Only Our Footprints in the Sand by Midair Machine, both found at freemusicarchive.org. And I'd like to give a big shout out to Podcast Detroit for hosting us and helping us record our, uh, our episodes here. You can find them uh, online at podcastdetroit.com, on Twitter at Podcast Detroit. And a big super shout out to our, uh, our sound engineer, Kate. Thanks so much. And thank you. Uh, our families, Vicky and Sean, uh, thank you for putting up with us and uh, loaning us your Wednesday nights. And uh, all of our friends who have sat with us at our tables all these years. Indeed. And to our listeners. We Good love night. you all. Good night. Good night, everybody.